Welcome to the BetUS College Football Show. This is the Tuesday, March 26th edition of the show. I am your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on all of the socials at GaryWCE. Now, I know most people are fired up about the NCAA tournament, the Sweet 16s in a few days, but guys, I got to tell you, we are 151 days from Florida State and Georgia Tech kicking off week zero in Dublin. And you all know that the world of college football never sleeps. I mean, for example, uh, we just found out the 2025 SEC football opponents last week, uh, which, you know, this sport has absolutely no PR direction. And then today, uh, as I'm reading here, Washington finalizing a deal to hire Washington State's AD, Pat Chun. It just goes to show you there's always something going on. Let me go ahead and bring in the fellas here. On the right side of the screen, of course, our award-winning professional handicapper, you have seen him dealing just straight winners on the BetUS College Basketball Show. He is at Kyle Hunter Picks on X. He is Kyle Hunter. Kyle, how are you, my brother? You uh, you ready for spring camp here? I am. Yeah. This is uh, this feels different talking college football here. I've been so deep <laughs> into the NCAA tournament. This feels like a big switch of uh, pace here. But I do want to say a shout out to the uh, college basketball show and all the viewers. Uh, we just crossed 10k subscribers. So if you haven't subscribed to that, go ahead and do it. I'll give the quick plug. But guys, I'm looking forward to talking college football here. This can be a lot of fun. Yeah, the Bet U.S. College Basketball Show is rolling. Of course, uh, TJ, uh, big man. Of course, it, you got Maddie Cox over there. Corby doing fantastic things. I am uh, personally, I'm a fan of the show. I enjoy what you guys are doing. Hit 10K. That is a big, big milestone. Personally, here we're trying to get to 20K. So if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and do that. We certainly appreciate that. Of course, left side of the screen, he is the numerical guru. He's our stats guy, our analyst, if you will. He's more into. Uh, you know, NCAA wrestling than he is basketball brackets. At Stats of War on X, he is Parker Fleming. Parker, my friend, we have got spring football coming up with the UFL, a bunch of college spring games. How excited are you to get football back on your TV? I, I am really excited, Gary, and I just want to point out, I posted there, I didn't have odds or anything, but I did post and correctly picked four of the five uh, NCAA wrestling champions that I picked for tournament. So we're all <laughs> a little bit of a heater here. I, I, I know Matt, as they like to say over in the uh, in the, the wrestling parlance, like, uh, like, you know, ball in college football. I know Matt, but yeah, excited. Maybe we got a little UFL, done some power ratings for those, excited for, uh, for those games. That'll be a lot of fun. But yeah, college football, I mean, feels like you take a nap in February and you wake up and brother, we're drinking from the fire hose again i mean so much has been going on doing doing projections getting under the hood monitoring transfers which we'll talk about but um yeah some 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 just all sorts of stuff going on in college football right now most certainly yeah, the sport never sleeps it never sleeps kyle uh, do me a favor uh tell everybody how they can help out the show you know help out this uh this channel here tell you what the easiest way to help us out is hit that thumbs up button below which is super fast subscribe to the channel uh, also hit the notifications bell so you know when we're going live. We will be going live a uh, decent amount of times here in the off season, so it's a perfect time to hit that bell so that you know when we are going to go live. Most certainly, there is the podcast as well. Uh, remind everybody about that. The Bet US Football Show. You can find it on any of your favorite podcast apps. Uh, help us out by leaving a nice five star review over there. Uh, as always, make sure and keep an eye on the latest odds over at betustv.com slash odds, and you can join in on the action at betustv.com slash join. All right, gentlemen, there is a lot to fit into today's show, so uh, let's get after it. Let's go ahead and do this. Topic number one on the day, the CFP finances have been finalized. All right, now, while I was out of the country for a bit a couple of weeks ago, uh, the college football playoff finalized the uh, the financials for their next TV deal. Ross Dellinger from Yahoo and... Uh, uh, Heather Dinich from ESPN, they've done a great job reporting on really all of the latest from the business side of the sport. Uh, but guys, I mean, we, we still don't know whether we're going to have a 12-team or a 14-team format starting in 2026. Uh, we do know that ESPN bought the rights to this thing for uh, $7.8 billion over six years. That comes out to about $1.3 billion per year. Now, it used to be power conferences equally split about 80% of the pot, which was around $460 million per year over the past 10 years. Uh, but now, as we all have seen, the power has shifted. The SEC and the Big Ten, they're going to split about 58% uh, of this. The ACC and the Big 12 are going to split 32%. Notre Dame gets 1%. The rest goes to all of the smaller conferences and the independents, uh, the MAC, the Sun Belt, uh, AAC, et cetera, right? Uh, it breaks down like this, all right? Uh, SEC schools are going to get $23 million. Uh, the Big Ten schools uh, are going to get $21 million. AAC, close to $14 million. Big 12, about $12.5 million. 
Notre Dame gets around $13 million, And then all of the smaller schools are going to get basically peanuts. It'll be less than $2 million per school. And if that wasn't crazy enough, I mean, the SEC and the Big Ten are now going to get more voting weight in the next format. Uh, and there's a look-in clause that could renegotiate the whole thing if major realignment occurs before 2028. You know, things such as Florida State or Clemson leaving the AEC, or excuse me, ACC, uh, which we're going to get to here in just a little bit. Kyle, I want to start with you on this. Most people, they just want to see what happens on fall Saturdays. Uh, But as we've seen since the advent of the BCS, there has been a gigantic shift in which conferences win the most, even when the conferences were a little closer monetarily. How big of a deal is this? And, you know, just on on your perspective, how is this going to change things in this sport going forward? I mean, I think it's definitely a huge deal. I mean, those those uh, monetary amounts that you said from one uh, conference to another are significant differences. I mean, that's a, that's a massive difference. And I think the the big takeaway is the SEC and Big Ten have such bargaining power right now. I mean, they they are uh, super conferences with mega power. They've always had plenty of power, but they have even more power than they had before. And I feel like this kind of split makes the big name teams in the ACC, the Big 12, even more likely to look for a new conference as soon as possible. And that's going to be the big news coming up is, you know, who's going to go where? Are they going to be allowed to go where? What's going to happen? But, uh, you know, the little guy, uh, you know, I assume that some of those smaller teams are going to want a larger playoff. And then that's going to be a fight, too, is, you know, how many of the the teams will be in the playoff? You know, we have 12 team will go to 14 right away. I don't know. But the SEC and Big Ten, they always had power. They have a lot more of it now. Yeah. Parker, what about you? Any thoughts on the, you know, the playoff power dynamics at this point? Yeah, if there was any delusions about who owns the sport, I think those have been um, taken care of very, very clearly and very yes. ex- explicitly this this offseason. And it, it does. I, I am lamenting a little bit the fact that we are just trusting that the Big Ten and the SEC are going to do what what's right for the college football uh, for sport as whole and, and the regular season. I think that. Um, again, when we talk about playoff expansion, I, I think there's a fine line to toe about um, you want the guys to have access. You want the 2014 TCUs, the 2000 eight Utah's 2007 Boise States. You want all those guys to have access because there is a non-zero chance they will win a game and change fundamentally the, um, landscape of the college football national championship and that's fun but i think that uh even now as we see this and we see how much money is going into it we see the nfl talking about weeknight games we see the consolidation of the tv networks around conferences it's important to remember and to advocate explicitly that the 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 saturdays in the fall is is the premier feature of college football that's what's good about the sport and if you let the tv execs take over if you let the uh playoff race and the national championship and the big conference matchups take over the sport they they will i think that uh, it's it's really a, an interesting point uh, in time with with just how this is shifting and how much the NFL is dominating ratings. We saw just today the NFL is announcing that they're coming for Christmas and they're going to kick the NBA off of Christmas. Um, mm-hmm. And they're, they're and it's on Wednesday the NFL might, this year. Yeah, like it's, and so it's on Wednesday. It's going to be every day of the week. Player I mean, safety be damned. The NFL is coming for every every night of the week and really pushing that in. We saw last year on Black Friday. We've seen some Friday games. Uh, and, and so it is it is an interesting time. Uh, but I do think that it's important. I think it's paramount for every college football fan to remember that um, the national championship race is fun. But beating your rival, winning your conference, uh, winning on Saturday is what's really important in the sport, even as the the money is shaping it. I think the fans do have a voice and and, and can vote with their wallet, as it as it were, and uh, and entertain those stories of good football being played at multiple levels across the country. I don't want to spend too long on this, but Parker, are you a fan of the the potential of a G5 playoff? I don't like it from the standpoint of the way that it's being presented. A lot of it is Hey, um, and, and I won't name names, I won't point fingers. I'm, I, I'm talking about people <laughs> I'm friends with and I disagree with. That's fine. Um, but have said kind of, you know, you know, the small schools rattled their sabers and they want to change. Well, change is here and now they have to deal with it. And a lot of it is, you know, remember your place. And and I think that walling off the G5 playoff. So a G5 playoff, extremely fun, right? Might be really, really cool. I, I'd actually rather see G5 teams get more access to playing, you know, let's, let's you know, let's not put Liberty versus Oregon, right? Like, let's, let's right. figure out a way that we could get Liberty versus Oregon. North Carolina last year or something, you know, and a team where maybe they're a little more evenly matched and we can see uh, some of that, some more opportunities for that. So I'd much rather just move in the direction of meaningful bowl matchups that are outside of kind of the traditional structure rather than completely walling off the G5 and say, hey, you little guys, you go play over there. So um, I, I don't 
doubt the idea that a G5 playoff would be very fun and there'd be compelling storylines. It could be a very rewarding experience for a lot of players there. But I do think that um, there's no need to intentionally impose the bifurcation of college football into, into tiers. Like we know certain teams are playing different games. That doesn't mean that the best team every year shouldn't be given access to try to play for the national championship. Uh, e- even if we know, you know, even if Vegas says they're going to lose. Okay, that's great. We, you know, Vegas doesn't determine the outcome of, of those games. Vegas gives us uh, a market-based prediction. And uh, I think we still should absolutely play the game. So I'm in favor of more access to more quality teams at different levels being matched against uh, the, the, the upper tiers of, power five as opposed to walling it off and telling the little guys to stay in their place and and take whatever beans are thrown on the ground in their general direction kyle what about you you uh you agree with what parker said absolutely agree with them um i think it's the kind of the wrong message to send you know it's like hey this would be a lot of fun you go play on the side over there of course we'd enjoy watching it i mean you know we, we're going to watch college football we're going to watch good games but you know is it really the right message to send to them that like you know no matter how good you are this is the most you can play for right here. Um, I don't like that message. I mean, we've seen teams that are, quote unquote, the little guy that can beat some of those big teams. I, I think that they should still be able to have that opportunity. You know, if some of them get beat up, then it is what it is. But uh, like Parker said, you know, there's still going to be plenty of good matchups for those teams. You know, there's not uh, an infinite amount of power teams that would have beaten up the mid, you know, mid-major, quote unquote, I'm thinking college yeah. basketball terms. But <laughs> um, yeah, the, the smaller teams, the G5 uh, teams, there's plenty of them that could have beaten power conferences teams in the last few years. So why should we take away that shot for them uh, just for them to say, look, you know, congratulations, you're the best of these teams. And, and all of this might be for naught, you know, depending on what ends up happening with, uh, you know, the proposed or, I guess, potential Super League going forward. Uh, who knows what they're going to end up doing, right? Charlie Baker came out with a, and he's the uh, the NCAA president, but he came out with this whole idea of, okay, if you can afford to pay your student athletes $30,000 a year, like half of them, then you'll be in this level of Division One, And if you can't, then you're going to be in this level of Division One. So it would be you know, basically another split, right? You've got FBS and FCS and then D2 and then D3, and it, who knows what they're going to end up doing. But uh, but for now, you know, the finances are set on this version of the CFP for at least uh, the next eight years, and yeah, who knows? Who knows? Well, your right? contracts we, are going to mess this up regardless. Like, oh, the, yes. everything we're talking about now is going to be apply for, what, maybe two seasons? And yeah. then, like, they have to do some kind of player contract thing, which I think the language is starting to move around towards that. With You you, you see, we, the Wild West comments, I think, are less and less in bad faith, and more coaches being like, holy, I cannot <laughs> handle this. And it's true. It's very hard to handle this idea that, like, you have to recruit a guy like every day for four years, otherwise yes. he's going to leave. And that's, hey, that's, that's impossible. That's, that's, that's just unfair perfect. to the athlete and their development. It's unfair to the coaches. I, my, my crazy idea, Gary, <laughs> I like give us contracts so that we know what we're negotiating with and you could buy players out like, great, that's fine. Right. We, can, we can do that. European soccer does a great job with that between leagues, even some kind of fix to what you're willing to spend separates college football really, really nicely. There's some trickle down economics there, the good kind, not the bad kind. And, uh, I, I'm I'm almost like rooting for a world where like Crystal Conte just takes over the the college football when the Big Ten and the SEC break off, and then the lower conferences just kind of glom onto that, and there there's some like tiered you know kind of structure there. Like that, I think that's where we're going. I think that you just transitioned perfectly into topic number two here. Almost uh, like I had the sheet. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so let's talk about the transfer portal. Uh, big news that came out a couple of weeks ago. Caden Proctor. Uh, transferring from Iowa back over to Alabama. Uh, Look, the first transfer portal window closed on January 2nd. The spring window does not open until April 15th, so he's not technically in the portal right now. But uh, this has already been just an absolutely historic year as far as the portal is concerned, right? In 2023, uh, per on three, we had 2,688 uh, players that entered the portal between December 1st of 2022 and May 1st, 2023. And then the format changed to a December window and a spring window. All right, so since the December window opened, so I just told you it was 2,688 players overall last year. In December alone this year, we've already had 2,332 players enter the portal. Now, I'm convinced it's going to get even crazier on April 15th. Um, There are players entering the portal 
every single day. But the ones that you're reading about actually entering the portal right now uh, are mostly graduate transfers, right? Players that have already graduated, they can enter the transfer portal at any point, anytime they want. All right. Now, Parker, we, we did see, you know, Caden uh, Proctor, he was all SEC freshman tackle. Uh, he decided to transfer from Alabama to Iowa immediately after Nick Saban retired back in January. Uh, but he's already let it be known. He went on a spring break trip with some of the uh, the former uh, or some of his uh, former teammates at Alabama, and he is transferring back to Tuscaloosa. He's not even going to go through spring practice with the Hawkeyes. He went in. He got some NIL money. Uh, rumors say it was like a hundred thousand dollars, and now he's just going to go right back to Tuscaloosa. Uh, we're going to see more of this, aren't we? Like, is the transfer portal going to be the death of analytics as we know it, or or will analytics, you know, have to get really even more detailed down to the player and not just the teams. Like, give me, give me some thoughts on this. So in, in, in kind of a broader answer, and then I'll go specific there. Um, I, I'm under the impression and I have, I don't have inside sources on this. I'm under the impression that the NCAA politely suggested that Caden Proctor not play for Iowa, given the circumstances of his transfer, given the timeline, given text messages that were sent in October. So this, <laughs> this might be a little <laughs> bit more of, yeah, this, <laughs> This might be a little bit more of like, hey, this is probably not going to work out for you kind of situation that we might see. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he did take the money and run. Who knows? But I, I think there's a little bit more under the currents there. As for analytics, I, I think this actually provides a really interesting opportunity for uh, analytical growth in the sport of college football, particularly. Um, yes, player-based models, you, we got to do it. Gary, you and I have texted this offseason. We got some, got some fun stuff I'm working on to try and build towards um, a, a little bit more of a player-level model to account for some of these transitions. Um, the, our old returning production is is getting harder and harder to mes, mes, uh, measure, and I think that's important to understand that one guy can change the gravity of the offense. I sound like a broken record, but you saw two great examples of it recently. Um, Theo Weiss comes to Missouri to be the number two guy, changes the gravity of the offense. Luther Burden grows into what he what what they needed him to be, uh, and then Florida State they bring Keon Coleman in to kind of take over as the number one. Johnny Wilson thrives in a secondary role there. They've got two two excellent guys on on the offense there. So, um, really, really, I think that it prevents, uh, presents kind of a frontier. Coaches can't watch film on all 2,500 guys or, or whoever it is, you know, in, in, in the portal, right? You can't do it. Absolutely. So one, analytics serves as a great way to prioritize who you should watch, what you're looking for, and kind of how you can identify who might be next, who might be the guy that you want. Uh, and so I think actually it doesn't represent kind of the death of analytics, but but perhaps, Gary, we'll look back and say the transfer portal chaos is, is kind of the big bang that, uh, induced an analytical approach to player acquisition and player evaluation in college football, specifically because it is so important to find guys who fit and find guys who are likely to transfer. So um, as we move towards player contracts, as we move towards tampering being a little less blatant and obvious and dumb, I think we're going to get a, a lot more analytical consideration, one, to kind of sift out who are guys worth considering who are guys worth buying out. Uh, and then how much should we pay them? Should we pay for premium positions? Look at Ole Miss and their running back. They said, hey, I know you want to raise. I, I, we're just not budgeted for it. We're just not going to give a raise to that position. Uh, we're going to spend elsewhere. So we're seeing some of those salary caps similar uh, concerns come into the college football as well. So I'm actually much more optimistic about the role of analytics in college football, given um, how, how many players there are, given how many data points there are, given how much uncertainty there is with prospects uh, with, with, with all of this here. Uh, as for most of us, you know, in uh, late, late at night, pouring over spreadsheets, trying to find just one number like returning production that's going to help us with talent and everything. Maybe that's a little bad for us. Uh, but on the whole, I think this is a good thing for analytics in, in the sport. And I think there's an opportunity for football to undergo a soccer or baseball style revolution where um, analytical based scouting and player evaluation is the driving force in talent acquisition and team development. And the data is getting cleaner, right? That's the more we yeah. go along with this, uh, the more data we're going to have on individual players as opposed to position groups, et cetera. Uh, the, these different companies are doing a fantastic job, right? So, you know, we're getting a little bit better. Uh, we'll see how that ends up going. Kyle, over to you. You know, the Caden Proctor thing is, hmm. I mean, it's just one tiny blip here, right? I, I expect April to get absolutely wild, uh, you know, during and after the spring camps. Is is that your expectation here? Uh Tell me how, how you think this is going to affect sport going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think this is going to get more and more common. And, um, you know, people, though, there's going to be a few people that are upset, you know, whenever anything like this happens. You see reports come out, you know, from Iowa putting out all these reports of this is what happened, this is what didn't happen. 
Um, but as it gets more common, uh, you know, we're going to have to be willing to adapt. And as the changes come, I think Parker did a great job explaining how analytics would happen too. And I would sign up for a course for Parker talking about analytics oh, yes. like this. Like I'm sitting here like, this is great, man. I'm just going to sit back and, and he's going to teach this thing. This would be fantastic. Um, I think that one of the things to say is that it both makes the job harder because there's so many changes, but it also creates opportunities because changes create opportunities. If you have the same team, everybody looks exactly the same as they did last year. Even as you're just handicapping teams, um, everybody knows what that team is. You know, So if, if you have different coaches, new styles of play, if you have different players, especially if you're going to be able to put together player-based models like Parker's talking about, I think that's going to be fantastic for something like that because it gets you an extra edge. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's going to take time. But, you know, I mean, we, we put a lot of time into this to start with. So, uh, you know, I think these kind of changes could could end up being profitable in the future. Oh, most certainly. Most certainly. You can pay attention to who is going to be. Now, the thing is, trying to figure out, you know, will, for example, Daquan Finn going from Toledo to Baylor. Uh, he was one of the more talented quarterbacks, maybe the most talented quarterback in the MAC. How does that translate? Right. So I think analytics are going to help with that, like help us figure some of those things out. But at the same time, you're you're just going to have to see it play out in a lot of cases. So uh, we'll hop off of that one. We're going to keep this show rolling. We're already 20 minutes in and we still have a ton to talk about. So let's move to topic number three here. And that would be the Clemson lawsuit against the ACC. Uh, Look, Florida State filed a suit against the ACC in the state of Florida back in December. Uh, And that was you know, very widely known in attempt to get out of the conference early. Uh, the ACC then filed a countersuit in the state of North Carolina. Well, now Clemson filed a lawsuit against the ACC as well, and it was filed immediately after the ACC agreed to that new CFP deal, which we just talked about. And for all intents and purposes, uh, signing that deal admitted that the conference is now on a lower level than the SEC and the Big Ten. Uh, I don't think that Clemson and Florida State are okay with them admitting that. Uh, Kyle, and then and then Parker on this. What was your first thought when you heard that Clemson had filed a lawsuit against their conference? You know, I I don't know that I have any great in depth thoughts about this, other than just, I mean, it's just uh, um, it's understandable. I mean, you know, do you want to be a power conference team that's that's all at once like you know you're on a different rung than somebody else? I mean, you're you don't want to be at a disadvantage. I understand where they're coming from here, certainly. Uh, I don't know how this is going to play out other than there's going to be a lot of changes. I mean, there's, this is, things are not going to look the same in a year or two or five years is what they do right now. Uh, you know, I, I was reading some of the quotes from the complaint filed and it's just pretty interesting. You know, these uh, 140 million exit penalty and grant of rights used to bind schools, you know, these has to be struck down, things like this. And, you know, I think we're just going to see more of this. I mean, you know, who's who's next? Who's going to be the next team that says we can't compete with this? You know, they have this much. We have this much. Uh, what's that going to lead to? I don't know. I mean, you guys probably know more about this than I do, other than to say that, you know, it's just uh, the changing landscape. We've talked about quite a few things already that are changing landscape. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot more changes soon. And what you just mentioned there, by the way, uh, part of their argument is, you know, the withdrawal penalty is excessive, right, for the ACC. Uh, the Big Ten has no withdrawal penalty, and the SEC's is $30 million if you give uh, two years' notice, $40 million if you give a one-year notice, and 45 million if you give no notice. Uh, but that is, I mean, that's pennies, right? It, Texas A&M just paid Jimbo $77 million to go away. So, you know, and they might pay John Calipari. Kentucky might pay him $33, bucks or $33 million to, uh, to go away. Parker, uh, what, what was your first thought when you saw this? Billable hours, Gary, are undefeated is the first <laughs> thought that I Always had. Always will be. <laughs> um, and this is, this is more important than that. I think we are understanding. I, I legitimately understand the economic grievances insofar as their good faith and not just we want to be with the cool kids, which I think there is an de- element of that. But I do think there is a legitimate argument here as well, where if our revenue goes down comparatively across – compared to our peer institutions, and you're going to charge us the same, if not more, to leave, and you've done worse. I mean, the ACC needs to be held held accountable for, frankly, having their pants down uh, during all these negotiations and being on the outside looking looking in. Um, And and I think I understand that absolutely. Um, 
I, again, I think we're moving towards like an agglomerate and abdicate situation with the NCAA. I'd urge people to revisit the night report because I think the bubble is going to burst with, you know, Oregon's rowing team going to Rutgers or whatever. I mean, it, you know, that's that's an absurd example. But um, we've got to divorce the 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 other sports from football and, and maybe even basketball and re- realign the conferences that way. It works well for wrestling right now, I'll, I'll, I'll point out. Um, but generally here, we're, we're looking at... I, it's got to feel bad as a Florida State or a Clemson to have been, uh, you know, Clemson clawed themselves into a blue blood the last 10 years under Dabo Sweeney and, and Florida State perennially was was there kind of at the beginning of the BCS era and then now has clawed the way back to national prominence. Florida State got screwed this this last season. Florida State played by the rules, did everything right. And uh, the committee arbitrarily said, you're not invited to our TV at Invitational. So one, they lost out <laughs> a bunch of money from that. But two, they also lost out on... Um, the, 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 you see that and you think, okay, the deck's already stacked against me. And now I have a conference that won't play, that can't, that can't step up with the big boys. I'm at a structural disadvantage. I'm not going to sit here and let my, you know, let my opportunity wither away. So I certainly understand them fighting for it and, and trying to realign. Um, it does feel like there is a great reckoning coming and, and maybe it is the lawyers, maybe it is the billable hours that, that end up saving this and, and figuring this out. But I ultimately think this is just another necessary step on the road towards a college football affiliate structure that is not governed by the NCAA and is not uh, beholden to the other sports as well. Another part of their, I guess their argument, uh, is that they never authorized the ACC to sue Florida State. Of course, the ACC has since sued Clemson almost immediately after Clemson filed a lawsuit against the ACC. And apparently that's in the bylaws somewhere that it, there has to be a vote and whatnot. This thing has gotten just ridiculously messy. Uh, I'm of the belief, you know, Parker, I agree with you that eventually we are going to see a split of, you know, football revenue sports away from the non-revenue sports. But I, I think it's going to be with a lot of gnashing of teeth, right? It's it, it, This is going to be a big deal. Uh, I'm of the belief that these two are going to get out of the ACC. I think the issue is figuring out where they're going to go. And if anybody else decides to push this along with them, right? North Carolina is the linchpin that holds the ACC together. Uh, so let's let's try and get out the crystal ball real quick before we before we change topics again. Uh, does the SEC take Florida State and Clemson to you know potentially protect their geographic footprint? Um, maybe does the Big Ten get them while the SEC tries to take North Carolina and Virginia, uh, and that expands their TV footprint? Or does nothing happen at all? Uh, Parker first, and then Kyle. What do you guys think about this? I think anyone's guess is is at this point. I think my biggest <laughs> my biggest lean, Gary, is I'd love to be on the board of advisors for like Clemson or Florida State, and just think about the dinners that the Big Ten and the oh. SEC are going to buy those guys as they're talking and negotiating. I just want to go to the steakhouse, man. That's that's what I that's what I thought about. It's like who who are they, where are they going to go? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine, and I think there's valid reasons for both of them. But I would love to be wined and dined by the Big Ten and the SEC to sway kind of which who who I'm going to be able to sign a deal with. Kyle, what about you? What uh, what do you think you'll have in here? Uh, the funny thing is, I was as soon as you asked that question, I was thinking, I hope one of you guys knows better than I do because <laughs> I I really have no idea. Like I don't even know what to guess here. Um, It'd be so funny think- if we were a show where we were like the you know you would see is a thousand percent going to go to the SEC. <laughs> my my super secret sources have said. <laughs> Lock. Yeah. Um, I I don't I don't know. I I think that um, plenty of different options are on the table. And uh, all of those will be uh, looked at very in depth. So, like Parker says, there are going to be lots of those meals. There's going to be lots of uh, meetings. Uh, we won't hear of all of them, but we'll hear about some of them certainly. I, I tend to think that it, it, maybe this isn't a think. This is what I envision happening: is the Big Ten grabs Florida State and Clemson because Notre Dame is not going to join the conference. They've They got their affairs in order. They've got the money that they need to stay independent and they've got their assurances all the way through 2032 or whatever it is. Right. So I don't think the big 10 is going to get Notre Dame, but if they get Clemson and Florida state, that means they're going to add two new states to their footprint. That's going to help out with the big 10 network because in states where they don't have a school, they get like 10 cents a month from cable subscribers, which is not a huge thing because people are dropping off a cable, but they're still YouTube TV, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but those are, that's, that's one thing. The other part is the SEC, North Carolina and Virginia. That's two more States, big populations. 
more TV revenue, etc. That's my guess because everything appears to be about money these days. Um, but who knows? Who knows? It, it, we're probably going to be playing or paying players pretty soon. Uh, so all of this might just be – all these contracts might be ripped up and we'll just move to something else. A uh, quick reminder, right quick, if you enjoy this show, help us out. Like the video. Tell your friends about it. Uh, subscribe if you haven't already. You can hit that notification bell. That way you know when we're going to go live uh, because these are a little bit sporadic in the spring. I will go ahead and tell you we're doing another one in two weeks and then another one two weeks after that because we're going through spring ball. Uh, then it gets a little more sporadic over the summer until we get to yeah, late June and you know early July, and then we are knee-deep in this thing. So uh, if you're in the chat and you've got a question uh, literally about anything, football or not, whatever, toss it in there. We're going to hit it on Q&A at the end of the show. All right, moving right along, gentlemen, we're at the end of March, and while everybody's focused on the NCAA tournament, uh, college football spring practice is going on across the country. April brings us spring games. There's none this weekend, you know, because of Easter and the start of the UFL season. <laughs> and and while this will uh, will be before the spring transfer portal, I think we're going to be able to find out a few things about some of these teams just over spring camp. Uh, today, I do want to go over, you know, some questions about nine teams this spring, and we're going to go kind of quickly on these. Uh, Kyle, Parker, man your engines. Let's go on and start with team number one here, and that would be Penn State. All right, now they lost some names. Uh, they returned a ton of production. The question here is, what does that returning production look like with the new offensive coordinator, uh, Andy Kotelnicki from Kansas, and then the new D.C., former Indiana coach Tom Allen? Kyle, uh, give me your thoughts on the Nittany Lions. So I think uh, Penn State's one of those teams with a really high upside that maybe the, the floor is lower than it's been in some of the other years, but I think there's plenty of upside um, what their offense looks like with Kotelnicki and Drew Alar is fantastic. Uh, you know, I, it, can Alar have the upside that he was supposed to have? I mean, he didn't look like the guy that could, you know, consistently throw it deep, go win you a game. I mean, there were some of those ridiculous stats where, like, he hadn't even attempted a pass of 40 yards for, like, a, you know, six or eight games in a row or something like that. Finally, they did throw a little bit of that. But, um, you know, how aggressive will they be? What's the offense going to look like? Uh, is James Franklin going to be hands off uh, a decent amount there? I tend to trust the defense, even with losing a decent amount of players, to still be good. Um, I think Allen, uh, while he had some shortcomings as a head coach, I think he knows defense and um, he's a good motivator of players. So um, I think Penn State could be better than most people think. I mean, I, I like the outside the the box higher here as an OC, and I think uh, they could have a pretty good year. I I tend to agree with you on this. I love Penn State this year, uh, especially that schedule. I mean, that schedule sets up incredibly nicely. Parker, you got a thought on uh, on Penn State? If Penn State is going to make the leap from a team who is perennially third in that division, although divisions are dead, uh, they're going to do something like hire Andy, Andy Kotelnicki. I, I think what was really interesting about that is last year, Catron Allen and Nick Singleton both averaged, you know, about uh, Allen was like 2.2. Singleton was like 1.2. Yeah. 1.2 yards before contact per carry. They hired Kotelnicki whose Kansas team was, you know, uh, like two, two, two and a quarter to 2.5 on average, the entire team yards before contact. So just a schematic shift there. The the caliber of athlete that Penn State's going to have, the dream for, for Kotelnicki there is we've got athletes, uh, Julian Fleming, hello, um, coming in that are, that are going to be able to line up against guys and make plays. We're going to take all of the kind of gimmicky Kansas. We don't have athletes, so we're going to generate matchups out of motion and weird formations and, and mismatches. They put those together and you look at something that's going to be very, very frustrating, which I don't think Penn State's offense has been frustrating the last couple of years. Well, uh, I think it has been frustrating, but for the wrong reasons. It hasn't been right. frustrating to opponents, and and this might this might be the difference there. Uh, although I feel like we're repeating the same refrain. Penn State, very, very close, uh, just needs to get over the hump. Is Kotelnicki the way to do it? Maybe. I do think that Aller is uh, is a little bit uh, besmirched. I think, I think he's better than what he's been given credit for. I agree. I agree. All right, moving along. Team number two here, Notre Dame. That's right, the Fighting Irish. Mike Denbrock, he returns from LSU as the offensive coordinator under Marcus Freeman. Uh, you would think that the question is what Denbrock can do with Duke transfer quarterback Riley Leonard, but personally, I want to know what the offensive line and the quarterback depth looks like, you know, since Leonard is uh, is still dealing with an ankle injury. You know, he had another procedure. Uh, it looks like he's going to be out most of the spring. I think Freeman said that he'll be able to come back and do some things. 
Parker, uh, tell me something about the Irish. What are we looking for here? I wonder if we're not talking about 2023 for Notre Dame as, as an extremely missed year. You know, 10 and 3 there with um, a, 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 about as close a loss to Ohio State as one could get in a really brutal stretch of games. And then they just go out absolutely burned in that Louisville game and, and lose. Um, I, I really think that Notre Dame had all the pieces and experienced offensive line, two NFL guys there. Audric Estime, one of the best running backs in the nation and, and a guy I really liked in the late rounds of the draft here. Um, felt like maybe we're going to look back and say, wow, Notre Dame was super talented and they kind of squandered it in a couple games that mattered some of that is you know grueling schedule some of that is they went to ireland and then you know it's it's hard uh but some of that i do think is they just didn't have the edge to to win a couple games that they really had no business um losing with with louisville and frankly clemson at the end of the season and that ohio state game just came up short so if you're notre dame the, the the sell is hey we've got a lot of talent we've got continuity we fixed the offensive issue we felt like we were a little flat there last year our defense we know is going to be good uh the continuity there is really nice, and and I think they've got some athletes who who will break out. But the the question is really, is Notre Dame putting all of their eggs in, in Riley Leonard being healthy in, in that basket? I I think that's really really problematic for me. If I look at them, uh, and, and and try to think about futures and whether they can break into the playoff this year, you know, you're losing offensive line stability. You've got Texas A and M at the beginning. You know, we're going to find out pretty easily uh, and a decent enough schedule. But the issue is, you know, you're playing uh, Florida State's going to be the Florida State USC, maybe, or the are the two ranked teams you're going to face down the line. Someone like Georgia Tech could absolutely trick you up, trip you up. Excuse me. Uh, I don't know that Notre Dame is going to have the same quality they did last year. And while they have an easier schedule, I think they're going to be afforded less opportunity to screw up and still host a first round playoff game, for instance, um, just because the the injury risk is, is, you know, it's hard to say that about a kid, but just to say, if he struggled with time and he had a procedure in the spring, I think it's a valid concern to say, I'm worried about, I'm worried about Riley Leonard's health. And I'm worried about Notre Dame having the resume, just given the quality of the schedule that they're playing. They're going to have to go undefeated one loss to, to to host a game. I agree with that. Kyle, you got a thought on the Irish? Yeah, I tend to, to be slightly negative on Notre Dame here uh, this year, thinking that uh, Parker's correct. They had a really good opportunity last year. And um, while I think that Freeman's a good coach, and I'm not necessarily negative on them going forward year to year, I think this year could be a bit of a step down and um, yeah, the, the schedule is not terrible, but you know, I mean, you finish at USC after starting at Texas A&M. So it's not like an easy schedule and you know, Florida state's going to be a good team. Uh, you got a game at Purdue. That's not necessarily easy. Georgia tech can trip up people. Certainly. I don't think that they uh, will have the same dominance that they had in some of the games against teams that are lower last year. And I think that that could mean that uh, while last year they lost to good teams, uh, teams that, you know, were top 25 teams, it wouldn't shock me if Notre Dame loses to somebody that's not quite as good this year. I, I think the schedule could set up for that, could absolutely set up for that. Uh, next team, Oklahoma. All right, now we could talk about Seth Luttrell, uh, you know, taking over as play caller after Jeff Levy took the Mississippi State gig. But I am more interested in what the offensive line looks like and honestly whether the defense can take another step forward. Uh, Kyle, what should we know about the Sooners this year? That's in, in my notes. The first thing I put was offensive line. Like th they had really good offensive lines yeah. for a long time. Oklahoma has had really good offensive lines for many years. They've kind of been spoiled a lot of years. If you think back the last 10 or 15 years, uh, I know the offensive line wasn't tremendous at the end of last season, but they lost a lot of good offensive linemen and Jackson Arnold is really talented. Like I know he turned it up. We know he turned it over a lot in the bowl game. Um, it didn't look great, but also there were some great things. I think his upside is really high, but they have to have a good offensive line. I think that's the number one key to this team. I trust that the defense will be good enough. I think the play calling will be good. Uh, what's the offensive line going to look like? Uh, Oklahoma is a team guys that I don't want to take a big position on either way at the beginning of the season because I think um, there are lots of different variables that go into uh, whether they have success this season. I would rather see what they look like than I would try to bet some season win total or future on Oklahoma. But I think uh, offensive line is definitely the key. Let's see. Oklahoma had six turnovers in that bowl game against Arizona. Um Three interceptions for Jackson Arnold, like you were just talking about, Kyle. And I was looking for a sack total because that was our best option 
yeah, Parker, tell me about the Sooners. What what are what are we looking to find out this spring? Have we have we talked about? It's been so long since we've been on the show. Have we talked about how we're going to have to recalibrate to a new uh, reality where like nine and three is about as good of a season as you can really ask for at Oklahoma? I think we um, talked about that uh, last, and not just at Oklahoma, just across the board, right? Yeah, I mean, because this so schedule go, that Oklahoma go back got, and watch that. It's going to be wild. It's, it's rough. And they did turn over a ton of offensive line, which is not what I want with a new quarterback. I think ignore the bowl game. Arnold's good. That's not a question. Yeah. I think I think he's he's a fine quarterback and will be uh, very, very good. I, I, I think moving on from Levy is probably in the long run a plus EV move for Arnold's development and the offense that they will run. So I, I, I like what they're able to do there on the offensive side of the ball. They got a couple transfers in on defense that I think will move the needle. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's the biggest issue for me with Oklahoma is just uh, they're going to be playing against a level of physicality that they haven't in the run game, particularly Big 12. We're playing flyover football, right? We're playing, you know, you're looking at three-man fronts, you're looking at safeties converted to linebacker. You're playing some beef in the in the uh in well in the nfl but in the sec as as well so i think that's going to be a just calibration there are these subtle kind of differences for how do you strategize how do you react in game plans what can and can't you do um and so with oklahoma biggest question mark absolutely the offensive line uh, i expect them to be you know uh their ceiling with Arnold long term is probably higher than their ceiling with Gabriel this year. That might not be true. So we're going to need, you know, some tempered expectations from Oklahoma fans and understanding that you're in a process where, you, you know, you want to be eight and four, nine and three most years and then pop off and have a good year. You're not going to go to six straight SEC championships like you did in the Big 12. Uh, and so I think that's going to be a learning adjustment for for the coaches um, to figure out, you know, how do we how do we actually play this game? But then also for fans and, and betters, frankly, to say, all right, how much do I you know, Oklahoma last year, they looked like they, you know, struggled in Kansas. It was cold, all that stuff. How do I downgrade them this year? We're going to look at Oklahoma, get beat and think maybe I upgrade them a little bit. Uh, and so that's just going to be a very different kind of way to go. I think their, uh, their first sec game at home is hosting Tennessee. That one could get interesting. Uh, moving along next team, Alabama, the Kalen DeBoer era is going to start in Tuscaloosa. And my question for spring is what is the quarterback position going to look like? Uh, most people seem to think that, you know, Milrow might be a shoe in as the starting quarterback, but, you know, he brought in the, that kid, Austin Mack. Uh, I wonder if the hype on him is legit or not. Parker, what else are we curious about the tide here? I, I think it's got to be Milrow, but I think we got to talk about the offensive line. Getting Proctor back is really good. Uh, getting more stability out of the center position is probably long term going to help Alabama as well. Uh, Alabama set a current era record. Uh, so current era being as long as I have data, which is the 2019 season to now um, with the most disaster plays. I, I was calling them botch snaps and broken plays as a result of a snap. But we saw that in in prime time. We saw that in um the uh, the playoff really come back to bite them. Um, and so I think that some consistency there helps Milrow. Milrow is going to run the dink and bomb. He's going to scramble for first downs. They're going to, the intermediate passing game is really not going to be there. That's okay with Kalen DeBoer. I think we saw that with um, Washington last year. And uh, they're going to have athletes to, to isolate one-on-one. -on -one. They're going to run the screen game. They're going to try to run when they can against that offensive line. Milrow, when he's pressured, uh, his completion percentage drops from 71 to 40 his PFF passing grade drops from 90.7 to 39.6. So the offensive line, again, really matters for Alabama. There's hope with Proctor. There's some stability there. And they can protect Milrow and let him develop into a passer, into a distributor who can run that offense. Milrow's pressure to sack ratio, 32.4. So one out of three pressures, he was taking a sack. That is not going to, to stand. And so what that, that, that stat's relatively sticky. You can improve that a little bit. But generally, um, that's kind of what it is. So they're going to have to scheme around that and see if they can keep him protected, get the ball out quicker and, and kind of move around. We've seen DeBoer know exactly what he wanted in Michael Penix and bring him to, you know, a great career, bring him to a playoff run. I, I think that there's opportunity for Milrow to be the right kind of molding clay for DeBoer to put his offense on him. Um, and, and so I, 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 there might be some competition. I expect them to roll with Milrow and I expect them to be, um, one of the better teams in the SEC. Obviously, do we know anything in the post Saban era? I, I don't think I do. So we'll just kind of sit back and <laughs> and see early season. Like I don't know, Kyle. Maybe you have a thought on this, but I, I'm really not inclined to play any futures on Alabama or bet them early in the season because I just want to see 
I need I need to see a little bit before I'm too too confident about what they are as a team. Kyle, what uh, what you got on them? I mean, I'm looking at Alabama's schedule. It's a pretty hard schedule. I oh mean, yeah, they go to at Wisconsin, um, at Tennessee, at, at LSU, LSU, at Oklahoma, uh, and really, host Georgia. Yeah, I mean, really tough, really tough road games. Then you get to host Georgia, which is never going to be a good thing. I mean, you know, Georgia anywhere is a tough matchup. I think um, I tend to think that Alabama. Some of the people talking about Alabama's fall off. Um, are probably exaggerating a bit too much because DeBoer has won everywhere he's been. I, I think that DeBoer will do a good job at Alabama. I, I wouldn't predict the demise of Alabama uh, quickly in any way, but I agree with Parker that betting futures on them in any direction is kind of risky. I mean, there's just so many moving parts here. We want less unknowns, not more unknowns. So I'd rather wait and see. Caden uh, Proctor, by the way, who we brought up earlier, uh, six foot seven, three hundred and fifty five pounds. The uh, Washington transfer that came in to play center for Alabama, Parker Brailsford. Uh, he is six foot two, two hundred seventy five pounds. So big difference in those two guys. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll see how Parker Brailsford uh, holds up against SEC defensive lines for sure. Next one on the board is NC State. Uh, Dave Doran always going to field a good defense, right? Last year, he and Robert and I, the offensive coordinator, tried to make the offense work with Virginia transfer Brennan Armstrong. Uh, I think the question here is, what does Coastal Carolina transfer Grayson McCall look like in this offense? Kyle, uh, tell me tell me what we're looking for with NC State. Okay, so this is one of my favorite ones that I've kind of been thinking about quite a bit because um, NC State, they changed their offense. You remember at the end of the year, it was like Brennan Armstrong was basically running the most of the time. Like they, they kind of gave up on passing. Uh, you know, it wasn't working out too well. They had no running game from the running backs. I mean, those guys weren't getting anything done. I, McCall is great. Uh, everybody knows that. Uh, but I think it would be nice. And, and while he can move, uh, I want McCall to be able to throw the football mainly and somebody else to run the football. You know, are they going to be able to get a running game from the running backs? Uh, I think that's the big question for NC State because now they have a quarterback who's very accurate passer, is going to make good decisions. Can NC State move their offense back to something different? Because I don't think they want to run anything like they did at the end of last year. I do trust the defense to be good. Uh, you know, the offense should be good with Grayson McCall there. But I think they're going to need some semblance of a running game from a running back and not just try to, to uh, lean on a quarterback. Uh, if we're going to get to the futures on this show, I'm going to have to speed this up. So, Parker, I'll let you talk about NC State next time. Right now, I'm going to ask you about Michigan, right? Life after Harbaugh. All right, uh, the defense should be okay, but I think the question is, you know, it, if Alex Orgy is going to be the quarterback or if they're going to ride with Jack Tuttle. Uh, Sharon Moore did good things as OC, but what are we looking at for the Wolverines going into this season? In college football uh, and in, in the NFL, having no tape is often a much better signal than having any tape. And so I would prefer the orgy cat, I think would be a lot more fun offense, uh, get some athleticism there, maybe uh, a little bit different than what they've seen. Michigan sold their soul and not in a bad way, but they, they sold their soul. They sold out for a championship. They got it. That's great. Yeah. Harbaugh took everybody. Um, so I think Moore is in a hard position, but he's earned it. And I think he's got a great shot here. Uh, easy to get talent at Michigan can, to, to build back up. But I think the biggest thing I'm looking for Michigan here is what's the identity. You had just a charismatic figure who was the absolute center and figurehead of your program, even more than the athletic director, uh, and, and was kind of synonymous with, you know, he was the ultimate Michigan man. This is a new era. I think, hot take, and we'll move on. I think this is harder to fill in than DeBoer for Saban. Um, I, I legitimately, I legitimately okay. do. That's, uh, I mean, you might be onto something there. You might be onto something. Uh, we'll move next on Kentucky. Uh, Mark Stoops, he just continues to win in Lexington. Uh, Kentucky is number 35 in adjusted returning production right now. I know, Parker, that's a, maybe an antiquated stat, but regardless. Uh, the offensive coordinator, Liam Cohen, is still there. They brought back their offensive line coach, Eric Wolford, from Alabama. Uh, spring question, I think, starts with what the former five-star quarterback, uh, Brock Vandegrift, looks like. He transferred over from Georgia. Uh, Kyle, what do you see with Kentucky here? Yeah, this is one of the games that I want to watch the spring game the most of anybody because Vandegrift was supposed to be really good, but he's thrown 21 career passes. Like, uh, I mean, he should be good. Um, 
Kentucky's passing game has not been good the last couple of years. I mean, they haven't been as efficient as they should be. I think Vandegrift can be uh, upside potential, but I want to see what the offense looks like with him. Kentucky's going to play good defense. I trust that uh, the running game will be pretty good. I think, uh, you know, it's all about Vandegrift. And if you're going to watch one spring game, this ought to be high on your list because what what is the offense going to look like? I know they won't run everything, but uh, I think they have a good offensive coordinator and now they have a five-star quarterback. Pretty good upside here. They are always incredibly adaptable, right? Whatever they've got, they'll figure out something that works to be able to win ball games. Uh, I'm excited about Kentucky. Uh, let's move on. Florida State. All right, Parker, there are a lot of changes in Tallahassee right now. The quarterback, DJ Uyunglele, of course, he transfers in from Oregon State, uh, formerly at Clemson, so a little familiarity in the ACC. Uh, but they got to replace wide receivers, running backs, linemen on both sides of the ball. Uh, there's going to be a lot of new faces. Are, are we more curious about the offense or the defense with Mike Norvell's bunch? I think the defense will be legitimately good. They've got some dudes, especially on the interior defensive line, that should be really, really hard to mess with. I think they're losing so much on offense, that's going to be the driver. Uh, in a way, I feel like with DJU, we're almost like, uh, it's almost like Lucy keeps putting the football out there and I keep trying to kick it. And I, I keep flipping around. Because uh, I think in structure, he's great. He was great for Oregon State when he really was. It's not that he wasn't a factor, but it's, you know, he wasn't driving the offense. It's my sense from watching the tape and looking at some of the, um, some of the stats from last year that Jordan Travis was innovating a lot. And and I'm a little bit worried. We've seen how chaotic DJU can get. Uh, I think if Florida state can run the ball well, can get some structure around him. Uh, they're going to have to figure out who the dudes are on offense. And, and a lot of that starts with the offensive line. The good news is their offensive line was a mess last year and they still were good because their offensive line was rotating. They had a couple guys out with injury um, and back and forth. So I think there's a world where Florida State's offensive line is actually okay because there's guys who have experience. They just weren't all playing together at the same time. Uh, but I, I need to see DJU in structure. I need to see who's going to emerge as wide receiver one. The defense should give them a lot of leeway. You look at the schedule and um, I'm not really scared of a lot of people on our schedule until they get to Notre Dame. <laughs> so I, I think that's good. They're going to have some learning time against Georgia Tech, Boston College, Memphis, Cal, SMU even to figure things out. They're going to be more talented than all of those teams. Uh, and so this is this is kind of a gut check year for Florida State. I mean, look at what happened last year. The wheels absolutely fall off. We're going to learn a lot about Mike Norvell as a leader here with what he can have this Florida State do, team do, how he can leverage last year's disrespect and being left out of the playoff and an absolute you know whopping by Georgia, which everyone knew they opted out. That's fine. But um, how's How's Mike Norvell going to come from come back from that? I think we're going to learn a lot about him as a leader and a man and uh, how this team responds this year. I think one thing that we never have to worry about with Mike Norvell is offense, right? That, that yep. guy, can he can scheme them up. So uh, next one up, last team that we'll talk about here is Texas A&M. Kyle, I mean, we, we've heard nothing out of College Station since Mike Oko was hired, uh, and I think that's on purpose. They brought in a 23-player transfer portal class. It's currently ranked number two over at 247. And it's not just a bunch of former P5 guys with big name, big recruiting rankings. Uh, they got guys from Cal Poly, from Louisiana Tech, from Bowling Green. Uh, Elko wanted football dudes, right? Um, what, what are we most curious about with A&M in the spring, Kyle? I mean, A&M is, is definitely a wild card. I was looking at their schedule, guys. Their schedule is not that bad considering what it could be in the SEC. I mean, you know, you, you get uh, at Florida versus Arkansas versus Missouri at Mississippi State. Uh, things could be far worse than what they are if you're looking at that schedule. And based on how I trust Elko, I want to be high on Texas A&M. Uh, you know, they, they could be pretty decent. I, I feel like there are plenty of question marks here, but... You know, uh, is it going to shock us if Texas A&M has this big bounce back season? I don't I don't think it should. They weren't that far off last year. Uh, yeah. Curious what the health of Connor Wigman is going to look like. Uh, we'll we'll see on that. But yeah, we uh, we could go through teams all day long. So let's go through some more right now. We'll move on to topic number five, and that is our early futures look. And we're going to go through a bunch of these. All right. We're going to start. Um. Uh, well, first off, let me tell you, betustv.com slash odds. You can go and look at these odds live over there. If you want to make any plays, go check them out. Uh, let's start with the teams to make the college football playoff. So we have odds on this. We know the favorites, right? Georgia minus 900, Ohio State is minus 800, uh, Texas minus 500, Oregon minus 400. And then there's, you know, some notable teams that are also minus odds to make it. Uh, the format this year is five auto bids for conference champs. 
seven at-large spots. So, you know, most likely the SEC, the Big Ten, ACC, and the Big 12 champions are going to make it. Uh, These are all teams that are between minus 110 and minus 250 that you see on the screen there. Um, Clemson, Florida State, you know, for uh, for you guys listening on the podcast, Florida State, Clemson, Notre Dame, Kansas State, Michigan, and Ole Miss all favored currently to make the uh, to make the college football playoff. And I think if you go to BetUS right now, I think Miami is actually minus 110 as well. So the Hurricanes. Uh, gentlemen, on these futures odds, you know, I like to look and see who the plus money teams are that can make the field. And so we've got 11 teams here that are favored to make it. Uh, Utah and Alabama are even money, so I'm not going to say that those are favored. Uh, but let's, uh, let's go through some of these. Penn State is plus 110, Tennessee plus 200, Arizona plus 200, LSU and Kansas plus 250, Missouri plus 275, Louisville plus 275. And then you get into your Texas A&M, USC, NC State, all plus 500, Iowa, Texas Tech plus 700, Iowa State plus 700, Oklahoma plus 800, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'll, start, I'll start us off here. My first go-to is Penn State at plus 110, right? They are set up better and I think have an easier schedule than Michigan who is minus 150 right now. Uh, That Michigan schedule looks pretty daunting. And the Penn State one, if you really go pay attention to it, 10 wins and two toss-ups. Parker first and then Kyle. Tell me, uh, what other, I guess for lack of a better word, underdogs uh, do you think can make the field at a nice price right now? Yeah, plus 110 is not fun enough for me, Gary, on, on, on a show this early in the offseason, frankly. I'm looking I'm looking a little bigger. Talk to me about Iowa State plus 700. A lot of returning production. Oh, yeah. um, they do lose Nate Shieldhouse, but, uh, you know, you could argue Campbell's going to be fine with the continuity on offense. You look at their schedule this year. They've got Kansas State at home. They do travel to Utah, but uh, Cincinnati at home, Kansas is a neutral, Texas Tech at home, UCF at home. This schedule breaks super nicely for them to get into the Big 12 championship and I, I, I and then potentially win it. So uh, I really like I, – I think that's interesting here. I think it's a good spot for them. I think their offense last year really made some great strides in getting vertical and getting Jalen well involved in a way that's going to be uh, more conducive to, to to his success. So that one is really, really interesting to me. Um, if we want to talk super spicy here, Nebraska plus 1800. Oh. I, they got the quarterback. They lost a bunch of one score games last year. And maybe the turnover regression is actually going to regress. Maybe they're not going to have just the most absurd one score loss here. I think those odds are good enough to sniff around a little bit and think, okay, is Nebraska a, um, a contender to make the playoff just because they do have some talent. They were, you know, on the short side of close games and they do have a, a top tier premium prospect at the quarterback position here. I can believe in rule at plus 1800. I, I see the chat here. Uh, Bob jumps in Missouri schedule, super easy for an SEC team. And Chris, Says when has Iowa State won nine games? I'll wait. I think did they win nine in the twenty twenty season? Yeah, the meme is ten. That means they haven't won ten games. I think. Yeah, they they've won nine. It's uh, it's ten. It's ten. <laughs> All right, Kyle. What about you? Any uh, any of these plus odds teams? Uh, maybe Oklahoma State, who is uh, as of right now number three in the country in adjusted returning production right now. Uh, but Oklahoma State's plus eight hundred. Uh, got any got any love for Mike Gundy here? I mean, were you looking at my notes? I mean, (laughs) Oklahoma State was one of them I was going to say. I'll start with Oklahoma State and say plus 800. Gundy gets his team to overachieve every single season. They have a ton of guys back. Uh, We know Gordon's fantastic. The defense just has to be a little bit better. Uh, We know the defense has to improve. But stranger things have happened than Mike Gundy getting this team to a 12-team playoff. Plus 800, I like that. I also like LSU plus 250. Um, LSU's defense has to be better. I mean, I I think by default, they're going to be a lot better than they were last year. Obviously, a big loss at quarterback, but they're still going to have a good quarterback. I think their offense will be good. Their tougher games are at home. Bama, Ole Miss, Oklahoma, USC on a neutral. I think plus 250 is not a terrible bet there on um, LSU to make a 12-team playoff. Uh, They have a good coach. Uh, a program that's going to be good every year. One other point I want to make really quick, Gary. Um, I think the people, I mean, some of those are minus 900, minus 800, minus 500. 
I think if you're betting minus 800 on somebody, and I know, I mean, I'm an Ohio State fan. If you're betting minus 800 on somebody in March for something that is this far away, I, I, I'm i concerned about people that are betting stuff like that. Like, I, I just don't think that's a good way to win in sports betting long term. The, the idea yeah, if you, is if to you get need the, the dopamine price. rush, yeah. if you need the dopamine rush of minus 800, call, call a friend or something. Yeah. Just like get, get the dopamine <laughs> rush a different way and don't tie your money up. Yeah. <laughs> so if you can get the best price, because the reason that I've already taken right. Penn state at plus plus one ten is because I don't believe it's going to be plus plus one ten. I think by the time the season gets here, everybody looks at the schedule. They figure out, Oh, Penn state's got a, a pretty easy path. I think it's going to be minus odds by the time we get to, you know, July or August. Uh, so that's why I would go in and do that one. But, eh, you know, LSU, same thing. I, I think at plus 250, I think they could end up being around even money by the time we get to August if everybody figures these things out, right? So, Gary, uh, at, at what week in the season are you going to take uh, a bet against Penn State in the first round of the playoff? <laughs> oh, uh, it'll, it might be pretty early. It might be pretty early. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe I can hedge my money. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Uh, let's see, let's move over to Heisman bets. All right. Uh, it's a bit early to be going through these, but we do want to at least get started looking at potential names, uh, you know, before we give official plays in August, you know, right before the season kicks off here, the favorites right now, of course, you see on the screen here, Texas quarterback, Quinn Ewers and Georgia quarterback, uh, Carson Beckett plus 800 Oregon transfer quarterback, Dylan Gabriel is plus 1000 Ohio state transfer, uh, Will Howard from Kansas state. He is plus 1400 along with Alabama's Jalen Milrow. And then you got DJ Uyunglele, uh, uh, Jackson Dart, Garrett Nussmeyer, et cetera, all at plus 2,000 or longer odds there. Um, Parker, uh, it's it's rare that the favorites end up winning this thing. Now, you had told me you have been running some simulations here. Uh, what kind of players should we maybe be watching for on this? Yeah, so given the time we have, I, I, I won't flesh this out entirely, but basically I'll say before this, I, I have never in my life put a single cent down on the high school. I've never been in my entire life. I've only talked you're, about it here. You're saying that because and of Joe Milton art. <laughs> I'm saying I didn't play. I said it last year too. Um, you guys will see when Joe Milton wins the Lombardi trophy, you'll see. Um, but I, and so this, this for me is more like an applied exercise and like figuring out what's like, who's going to shape the narratives. And so I have, I have two, uh, I have two circled that are both plus 3,500 that I think are really, really interesting and could be there. So a team needs to be near the playoff contention, right? They, they don't have to be in the playoff. I, I think to win the, the, the Heisman, but I do think they need to be near contention. They need to be offensive heavy and they need to have a lot of volume, both in the ground and the air. So, uh, in anything I was looking at the past couple of years, it's gotta be a quarterback. I don't think it's worth you know, wasting breath on, on somebody who's not a quarterback for this award anymore, because that's what it's really morphed into. The two that are really interesting at, at plus 3,500 to me are Jalen Daniels and Cam Rising. Cam Rising is super old. He's super experienced. He's going to play in a new conference. Uh, and so he's going to get new looks against every team that he's playing. I think that gives him a lot of um, leeway to score on both the ground and through the air, put up a lot of volume. And then Kansas in that offense, I think with Jeff Grimes, the rushing offense is going to be uh, di different than Kotelnicki, but I don't think it's going to be worse. If Daniels can stay healthy, he's such a fun and electric player in the way that he plays and the way that he accumulates stats. I think he'll have a, a huge highlight reel of deep passes, a huge highlight reel of scrambles for touchdowns. And if Kansas can can get in that eight and four, nine and three kind of playoff conversation, I think there's a world where Jalen Daniels healthy the entire season gets on the podium. So those are my two that, that kind of looking at the numbers and looking at who's won historically, what you need are, 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 are long shots that I think are interesting. It, I, the biggest thing, of course, like you're talking about, uh, if he stays healthy, then we're good. And he hadn't done that for the last two years. So, uh, and boy, it, when I was previewing a little bit, I thought that bean was still going to be there. Um, so I, I was, I was already penciling Kansas into uh, into a playoff spot back uh, about a month and a half ago, but Sorry, Gary, Dor Jason Bean is 34 and he can't play college football anymore. <laughs> no, they're letting everybody else play. I mean, okay. <laughs> uh, I can't wait for the lawsuit on that one. Kyle, what about Jason you? Bean's going to miss the high of the playoff game because his kid's high school graduation is the same week. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, have you got names that, uh, that have piqued your interest at this point? Um, uh, one for me, uh, I haven't bet any of these and I, w I wouldn't bet them yet personally. Um, but Jackson Dart plus 2000, I kind of like, um, really a pretty easy schedule for SEC standards and less of a running game with Jackson, uh, with, uh, Judkins gone, 
there's a lot on Jackson Zard's plate, but a lot of opportunities because of that. Like he's going to be heavily used. Um, and I mean, a coach to scheme up some great offense, a defense that's going to give up quite a few points, but they should win a lot of games. I think Jackson Dart um, at plus two thousand is pretty good. I uh, I could I could ride with that one. I could ride with that. Uh, the guy that I have already made a bet on, not a big one, obviously, uh, but I think the number is going to go down. I, I mean, I put five bucks in to win one hundred twenty-five, and that's on uh, Nico Iamaliava uh, plus twenty-five hundred. The Tennessee quarterback. I mean, he tore up Iowa's defense in the bowl game. I think he's going to be fantastic in Heupel's offense. It, just a just a shot. And their schedule, by the way, is well. I'm going to talk about it in, in just a minute. So we'll we'll get to Tennessee. We'll do that. All right. Let's talk about who's going to win the championship. Uh, national title winners, right? These the teams that have a roster capable of winning three to four games against the best of the best in this new iteration of the playoff. And the usual suspects are up there. You see them up there. Georgia plus three thirty. Ohio State plus four eighty. Texas plus seven hundred. Oregon plus nine hundred. Then, of course, you got Bama and LSU plus 1,400, and everybody else is 1,500 or better. Um, what, what are some odds that have maybe shocked you guys on, on this? Uh, you know, we'll start with, uh, with Kyle first. Um, but anybody that, that maybe stands out that actually could win three or four games in this playoff against really, really good competition? I guess I'm kind of jumping back a little bit here, but LSU is plus 1,400 to win the championship and plus 250 to get into the playoffs, which I think tells you that plus 250 is probably a good bet. Yes. You know, I mean, that, that looks like a good chance to take. Um, probably my favorite one that I've talked about here today. Um, to win the championship, I'm going to go off this board and take a, a longer shot. Um, I, I mean, I'm wearing the Utah hat, Utah plus 6,000. Um <laughs> Whittingham, like I, I think all of us like drive the bus for Kyle Whittingham. It's an amazing coach, um, tremendous at everything he does, and I mean, I, I just think Utah has good upside. You know, they're going to be strong in the trenches every single year. Rising back, uh, they got plenty of weapons on the outside now and a tight end. So uh, I think Utah has a super high upside of the teams on here. Um, you know, Ole Miss, we just talked about, I think Ole Miss is a decent look. I don't know if plus 1500 is quite big enough, but, um, I do think they have chances. A big part of that Utah bet, by the way, is the fact that more than likely if they get to the playoff, they are going to win the big 12 to get there. And more than likely they'll be one of the top four seeds that ends up getting a buy. So they would not have to play, uh, four games against playoff teams. They would probably only have to play three. So that certainly would help things. Parker, what about you? Any uh, any that you're seeing here, you know, maybe those long odds like uh, like Kyle was talking about, or is there somebody on the screen right here that you're maybe fond of? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, the, the people have played that game where it's like, what's the smallest circle of teams you could draw or small, smallest number of teams you could draw a circle around and be confident that the, uh, that the national champion is going to come from there? I'm almost inclined to believe that circle is Georgia and Ohio State this year. Um, I, 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 I just, Georgia is really, really good. And we saw them kind of make a misstep last year and get left out. And, and I think that, I mean, I, I know at the end of the season, I had Georgia favorite against everyone on a neutral. Um, and, and I think that's going to be true again to start the season here. It's just hard for me to see a world where Georgia after last year is not, in the national championship game. And then Ohio state, this is the year they've, they've brought it all together. They've gotten, you know, everything they feel like they've needed. They brought in some talent. The defense is continues to get better under Jim Knowles. Um, and so those, those are decidedly unsexy picks. Obviously the two favorites, they're two favorites for a reason. It's really, really hard for me at this point in the off season to see value outside of those two, just because I believe they are head and shoulders so much better, uh, against the rest of the field. If you want a flyer, um, I, I think uh, that looking down, you could see a team of Oklahoma's caliber. Let's say the offensive line gels. They're plus uh, 4,000 4, here. Yeah. They get in as an at-large, um, and then you're you're kind of scheming, and their defense is really frustrating to play against. Brent Venables has an edge there. I, they, 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 their path is they're a much better team at the end of the season. They have a couple losses. They overcome them. They still get in, and then they kind of make a run. I, I don't know if I love that, though, because I think that's talking in college basketball parlance and not necessarily college football parlance with the expanded postseason. So just, just a variable to think about is, like, there is going to be a – um, when are you peaking kind of variable? That's a little bit different as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm boring and chalky right now in futures. It's just hard for me to see that Georgia and Ohio state are not going to be the two teams in the national championship. 
I hmm. so I agree with you because I do think both of them are are set up to be <clears> able to do that. I've got questions about both of them though. So I I mean this thing could be wide open, right? There's nobody on here that I feel is just completely dominant. Uh, Georgia's defensive line was not fantastic last year. Um, Ohio State, I mean, obviously a ton of questions about that bunch. And, I mean, they are turning over a bunch of different names. Uh, and they brought in good names. But, mm, you know, I'm I'm curious. I, I'm a little interested in Tennessee plus 3,500 just because I think they've got the quarterback. But, again, that's a tough tough schedule that they got to go through. We'll talk about that here more in a minute. Let's do this last one. Uh, we're going to go through to uh, win the conference here. Uh, we'll roll through the big four conference odds right quick. Give the viewers a little insight into which teams interest us in each of these. These odds are up. Uh, check out betustv.com slash odds. Let's start with the ACC, right? Clemson and Florida State are co-faves at plus 260, uh, but both have got you know some changes going on, so they're not exactly dominant, right? Uh, you look at this, Clemson lost four ACC games last year, and they're the favorite this year. Uh, Florida State is number 86 in adjusted returning production right now. Uh, I'll go on and start us off here. You see Virginia Tech on there at plus 1,600. Uh, the quarterback, Kyron Drones, is an absolute dude. They are number four in adjusted returning production. The schedule sets up nicely. Uh, they do have games at Miami, and then they host Clemson. But check this out. They avoid Florida State, Louisville, North Carolina, and NC State. It, it's year three under Brent Pry. Like, I, I love this one. So Kyle first and then Parker. Uh, who should we be watching in the ACC? I like that bet. I think that's a good bet. Um, you can't believe that there were actually discussions being had last year, like who's who's better, Wells or Drones. Like that was just. Uh, we won't go down that one anymore. But um, <laughs> I don't. I don't love anything else here in the ACC too much. Uh, plus two sixty, not a good enough number for me to take a favorite here. Um, I think SMU is going to be really good. I think they have a good team. It's plus 2,200. I know it's, it's a huge jump in co- conference strength. So I'm not betting this, but it's something I at least uh, would consider. Um, I think Virginia Tech's probably the best one on here, Gary. Parker, what about you? Uh, the, the SMU one, I'm a little weird. I just want to see about the travel, right? That's what I, that's what I want to see. Parker, what, uh, what do you see as far as some of these numbers? Uh, yeah, Virginia Tech feels like the move there. Uh, Ali Jennings is healthy. Drones, I think, has to work a little bit on anticipation. And, like, there are some plays last year where he took gains with his legs, but he left gains through the air on the table. And that's not good for your, you know, the couple games that were close that they lost that they, they probably could have won. It really looked like Drones was trying to make a play athletically instead of making a play quarterbackically, if that's a word, as a quarterback <laughs> through the air. So uh, I think they'll work on some anticipation, some timing for him. I, I was watching the, the film of Virginia Tech this offseason and just you just want to yell like throw the ball throw the ball it's there it's open you just gotta throw the ball and so if he can get on some of that anticipation they're gonna be really really fun i think virginia tech's gonna be everybody's kind of crush team this uh this fall they're 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 in a good spot and they play a fun style of football idk in the chat said uh uh, he thinks louisville is gonna compete louisville brought in like 27 or 28 different transfers uh i want to see if tyler shuck can uh can stay healthy so and they have a tackle among any of them i mean like does louisville have an offensive Starting five, uh, not, I mean, not yet, but the, the hope spring, is that they spring do, but we, coming. we have to see. <laughs> yeah, we got to see. Spring portal is coming on to the big 10. Uh, look, Ohio state, Oregon, Michigan, and Penn state. Uh, they're all between plus plus one fifty and plus 600 to win this thing. Um, the next closest in the big 10 is USC at plus 2,500. Uh, Parker first. And then Kyle, can anyone outside of the big four win this conference? I mean, are we, are we even taking a shot here? I like Jordan Maiava. I feel like they've made stride. And like with Lincoln Riley, I think they're going to have, you know, Tosh Washington there at wide receiver is going to be one of the harder guys to to, to grade, uh, to guard, excuse me, in the in the conference. But I just don't love USC as a, as a dominant championship team. It, 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 at this point, it would be hard for me to tie up my money in anybody other than Nebraska Flyer, if I'm talking about earlier, again, plus 6,000, that's a lot. That's a lot. And I could see the path there very, very easily. But again, if I had to draw a circle, I, I think I would just be Ohio State and Oregon here uh, who, are, who are kind of leaps and bounds. I would actually think Penn State might be a little undervalued looking at this list just because of what you guys talked about. Path is a little bit easier and and I like Kotelnecki. So um, yeah, the, that's that's really where my mind is at. If I was going to take a flyer, it would be Nebraska because um, those are just long odds. The USC schedule, by the way, is rough. And that's another one of those... Yeah. You know, Kyle, I'll get you in here. Like the the travel, I'm just curious 
what kind of effect this is going to have on on teams like this. Uh, Cal, you see anybody on this uh, on this list here? Yeah, and uh, I mean USC, they have a defensive coordinator that should help them be a lot improved. Is that going to happen right away or not? Um, definitely a lot of moving parts at USC. Uh, I think Penn State plus 600 is the best value on these. Um, It it could go sideways, of course, you know, uh, but I think the upside potential is there. It would really surprise me if somebody outside the top four wins the Big Ten. Uh, We got two more conferences we'll knock out right quick, the Big 12 and the SEC. So let's start Big 12. Craziest conference, likely to be the Big 12 again. Kansas State is plus 330, Utah plus 360, Kansas plus 650. Uh, And then you see Arizona with their new coach, Brent Brennan, uh, they are plus 750. And then, you know, Texas Tech plus 800, UCF plus 1,000, Oklahoma State plus 1,000. I mean, it's a, Oklahoma State's number three in FBS and adjusted return production. Iowa State there at plus 1,200. They're number one. Uh, it's a lot of options here. Kyle first and then Parker. Uh, do we feel good about any of these teams heading into spring? Well, I mean, you have to like Utah if I talked about them to to win a national title. I, I think Utah is just consistently so good in the trenches. I think they'll they'll do well in the Big 12. I mean, this is a, a team that's so consistent. They avoid Kansas State. They avoid Kansas. Obviously, the schedule is not easy or anything, but uh, think of the teams that are going to have to play at Utah at elevation that are not used to that at all. I mean, I think Utah has a great home field advantage, and that's going to be even bigger for some of these other teams that, I mean, you know, who's used to playing in a place like Salt Lake City? Uh, I like Utah plus 360. Parker, what about you? Gary, I, I frankly wouldn't bet the Big 12 with my mother-in-law's money this year, especially this <laughs> early. Uh, but I, I do I do have UCF circled as a dark horse here. I think their run game has just been so absolutely excellent under Gus, and it translated to the Big 12. Uh, KJ Jefferson there, I think that's going to be a lot of fun for him to be kind of dual threat, a lot of quarterback runs. Their offensive line is stout. Um And the way that they're consistently producing there, I think on the defensive side of the ball, they're making some strides. So UCF is my dark horse here. Plus 1,000 almost doesn't feel long enough. It feels a little too on the radar to call that really like a flyer. But uh, but I mean, I'm 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 absolutely not at a place right now where I want to commit anything to the Big 12 conference uh, future other than other than to say UCF's on my radar as a dark horse. Um, uh, Iowa State, I mentioned earlier yeah. as well, returning. I think that would be the other one there. But again, is is plus twelve enough long long enough odds to make that interesting to me? I'm not I'm not totally sure. There's I like the Iowa State schedule quite a bit. So yeah. and that does play a big part in these as these conferences mm-hmm. get bigger. Uh, some teams get an easier schedule, some don't, then it is what it is. Time to uh, start paying attention to those. Last conference, the SEC. Georgia and Texas, obviously the favorites here, uh, plus 200 and plus 250. Then, of course, you got Ole Miss plus 650 with their incredible uh, portal class. And Alabama plus 900, LSU plus 950. Uh, and then you start to drop down a little bit, Tennessee plus 1,000, Missouri plus 1,200. Uh, I'll start us off. I'm curious about Tennessee here. Uh, I obviously like Nico plus 1000. Uh, I think the defense can be pretty good with their, uh, their defensive coordinator, Tim Banks. Uh, you know, they got games at Oklahoma and at Georgia and they've got Alabama coming to Knoxville, but check out this list that they dodge here. Uh, Texas, Missouri, LSU, Ole Miss and Texas A&M. They don't have to worry about those on the schedule. Uh, on the other side, I mean, they are 14th in the conference in adjusted returning production. That's like 90 something, uh, nationally. Uh, Parker, uh, we'll start with you. You know, you and I hit on Alabama plus 300 to win the conference last year. Uh, Who intrigues you in the SEC this season? I'm worried about Tennessee's run game. Maybe we'll talk about that on a future show or text about that, but I think they're going to have a big drop off there. Well, so that, that, that scares me off a little bit about Tennessee here. Um, I, I said it last year, Saban plus money. I think in absence of Saban, it's really hard not to take Kirby smart with plus money here. Um, I, I, I mean, I think everything I've said earlier, I think they, that, that this is going to be a rebound year. Um, and they were, you know, still the best team in college football last year. So hard, hard for me not to circle Georgia there. What I mentioned, cause they mentioned in the comments, I like Missouri's offense. I- I think Cook and and Burden will continue to grow. I do think that I'm worried about Missouri's defense with how much they lost. It's not a matter of like, are they good? Is the coaching staff doing the right stuff? It is legitimately their coaching staff is gone there, and that's and that's hard. Um, and so I think that uh, I think that Missouri's one that I would that I would caution to stay away from. If their coaching staff had stayed, they'd be an interesting kind of returning development cycle program. Can they capitalize while the iron is hot last year? But uh, I think I think losing the defense to to LSU just across the board is, is going to be really, really hard on them this year. 
I I agree. Surprise. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, what about you? What uh, what are you seeing in the SEC? I think Georgia's gonna win the SEC plus two hundred. Um I mean, you can wait on that probably. I mean, there's no yeah. need to have to bet that now. I don't. I don't think that price will change significantly. I do think it's kind of interesting that Texas is only plus two fifty when Georgia's plus two hundred. Um, probably a little bit too much love there for Texas, and that's not me saying I think Texas is a bad team in any way, uh, but I think Georgia's really good. Um, Ole Miss plus six fifty, uh, not a terrible bet in my opinion based on the schedule that they have. Uh, but there's nothing else that's really jumping off the page at me. I, I think Missouri's offense will be good still. And I, I don't think Missouri's going to be a bad team in the next few years, but they lost so much on defense. Uh, they lost a lot of key contributors, guys that are going to be really good. Um, Missouri defense, uh, I think Missouri might be good at over team this year. Uh, that's interesting. Very, very interesting. Uh, let's close this out. Let's uh, let's get to Q&A. We close out every show with the uh, question and answer. Uh, we'll see what we got going on in the chat here. Um, let's see. Our question is from Mikey Low Betts. Now we did have quite a bit of interaction. We appreciate you guys for that. Uh, but we'll we'll jump on this question today, and then we're going to get out of here because we've gone way over because we could talk about football forever. Uh, Mikey Low Betts jumped in. He said, "I don't see any odds yet, but does Liberty win this USA again this year?" He said, "Western Kentucky added T.J. Finley, but Chadwell runs such a great offense, and Salter is back." Uh, Parker, I think you talked about this in the chat, but I, I don't think there's any reason to bet against Liberty winning the CUSA for years and years and years into the future because they have got significantly more resources uh, and a significantly better recruiting base than pretty much everybody else in that conference. Like, I, am I am I wrong on this? If you handed me a thousand dollars, Gary, and said, "All right, you have to you have to roll over a bet against a spread on one team for the entire season," I would pick Liberty. Uh, that that's that's how confident I am, and th- I mean they're just better than everyone else. And I think the thing about Chadwell, there's some misconceptions about why he's not he didn't take other jobs, and I think he would have taken NC State, uh, not mm, sorry, um, South Carolina back in the day when the things kind of lined up there. But uh, I I really think that. Jamie Chadwell's a guy who likes Liberty and a guy who's happy yeah. there and they have as much resources as, I mean, they're going to spend whatever. I, I think he is building long-term and very happy and they're going to be able to, to absolutely roll. Um, especially as, uh, they, they have resources better than their programs, other, other programs. And, you know, Chadwell's just absolutely diabolical on how they can, can, can create mismatches on offense. I just really don't see are in catastrophe any reason to believe that anyone else is going to win the conference USA in the next five years. Uh, I think That's what Chad Will is, yeah, what, what Chad Will's building, I think will be very similar to what Boise state was doing in what the WAC and then the mountain West for what the mid two thousands through about 2016, 17, whatever it was, uh, whenever Peterson uh, went to Washington, like I, I think they're just significantly better and better resourced, right? Kyle, uh, what about you? You you tend to agree with this? Absolutely. I think uh, Liberty, uh, I'm not optimistic on the, you getting great odds on Liberty to win oh, a yeah. conference yeah. because <laughs> nope. I think everybody's going to be high on Liberty. But I, I agree with what Parker said, betting them ATS uh, game after game will likely be successful. I mean, Liberty, you talked about all the resources and everything. You, you combine all the resources and the talent they're going to have, and then they have the best coach in the conference, at least in my opinion. I don't think anybody else can be taken ahead of Jamie Chatwell. So uh, you combine all that, you get a, a program that's going to be dominant. No love for Rich Rod. Unbelievable. Kyle just slinging hate against, today. against Chadwell. <laughs> the problem is that Rich Rod's going to take another job before he can build Jacksonville State up into a contender. Yes, Yes, 100% yes. <laughs> uh, just wild. All right. Uh, per the usual, of course, if you've got other questions, toss them in the comments. We'll be sure to get in there and answer anything uh, that you know that we can, I guess. Um, or, of course, you can hit us all up on X or Twitter. Uh, make sure to keep an eye open. Latest odds, of course, betustv.com slash odds. And join in on the action over at betustv.com slash join. Fellas, it was a long one. But that's going to do it for today's show. We're going to be back again April 9th uh, as we get some more information from spring camps and whatnot. So hit that notification bell uh, so that you know when we go live. And make sure to like the video and tell your friends about the show. Uh, I'll tell you this. We love and appreciate every one of you guys that 
chooses to tune in and give us a little bit of a time, right? We're looking forward to uh, to another big year here. You can follow us on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. Uh, Parker is at Stats War. Kyle is at Kyle Hunter Picks. Or you can follow me at Gary WCE. Uh, but with that said, for BetUS, where the game begins, of course, God bless college football, and we will see you all again in April. Thanks for watching. We hope you like this video. Subscribe and ring the bell to keep up with all sports content. Don't forget to cover all our major sports. All can be found on BetUSTV.com. Best of luck with your picks.